You are reading through the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, and you come to chapter 3. The Apostle Paul has an insight to share with us into what he calls the mystery of Christ. This mystery is, he says, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And then he adds this, Of this gospel I was made a minister, according to the gift of God's grace. Ask this man what he is, and back comes the answer. He is a minister. He is a servant of the gospel. It's what all the apostles were. That's why they were so thankful, Acts 6, for the appointment of those seven men to diaconal service, because that allowed them to give themselves to their primary calling, to prayer and to the ministry of the word. They were servants of the word. They lived to proclaim it, to defend it, to persuade believers to hold it fast, and to show how it impacted absolutely every area of life. While there are no apostles today, they had a foundational role, and the foundation has long been laid. But there are still ministers of the Word, servants of the Gospel in all its length and breadth and depth and height. They're serving in pastorates, they're serving in seminaries, and they're serving as church planters and as overseas missionaries, and at least in my country, uh, in open-air ministry. And They're serving in the universities, and they're doing so with their voices, they're doing so with their pens. They're not apostles, but in this sense, they are like the apostles, for they too are ministers, servants of the word. Now, when it comes to the equipping and the calling and the sending out of such men, we recognize the hand of God. It is he who puts it into their hearts to do this great work, and he who fits them for it and then opens the door to this sphere of ministry or that. Those of us here who are ministers of the word ourselves. We know that to be so in our own case, and we recognize it in the case of others. Those men of whom we have read in Christian biography are those men to whose ministries we are personally indebted. God is behind it all, isn't he? For the building of his church, for the advancement of his cause, he has been at work making ministers of the word. Our concern this evening, however, is with a very important part that we ourselves have to play in this, namely the identifying of such men. You think about the young men in your church, or you think about the older men in your church. Are there any whom you might encourage to consider gospel ministry. As you look at their gifts, as you look at their commitment to Christ and his church and his gospel, is there anyone who has the potential to serve in gospel ministry? Or you might ask similar questions of men who are already in training. As you look at their gifts, as you think about their commitment to Christ, and his church, and the gospel. Take them one by one. Is this a man whom we can encourage to continue? Is he someone whom we might call and set apart? Someone whom we might send? Well, it is to this matter that we are turning our thoughts for a little this evening, the discovering or identifying of men with the requisite gifts and graces for serving Christ in the ministry of the Word. And to help us, we're turning to Acts 15 and 16 and to Paul's choice of Timothy as a companion and fellow laborer in the gospel. 
We're going to train the spotlight very particularly on Timothy. And as we do so, we are going to see in him a number of key things for which we should be looking as we think about men who we might train, call, and send out into the work of the gospel. Well, we'll come to Timothy in a moment or two. But before we do so, a word or two about the historical background. And I have two reasons for mentioning the historical background. One is that it will give us a lead-in to the selection of Timothy as a companion for Paul. And the other... Well, you'll have to wait till the end. (laughs) Suffice it to say that the sketching in of the background will allow us at the end to follow out a line of application that is intensely relevant to life in our churches and which is full of encouragement. Well, to the background, which I know is very familiar to you, so a few words will suffice. Paul and Barnabas have returned from what we know as Paul's first missionary journey. It had taken them to the southern part of what the Romans for decades had been calling the province of Galatia. And there in the cities of Pisidia and Antioch, Lystra, Derbe and Iconium, churches were planted. And now, Acts chapter 15, verse 36. After some days... Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas' response, great idea. And then the problem. Because Barnabas wanted to take with them a young man called John Mark and Paul was opposed to to the idea. And you remember the background to that. John Mark had set out with them on the first missionary journey and then for some undisclosed reason had withdrawn and had returned home. Well, Barnabas thought it would be a good idea to give this young man a second chance and Paul didn't. And the disagreement between them became so sharp, verses 39 and 40, that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. You cannot but feel sad as you think about it carefully, and we're meant to feel sad, because these two men had stood side by side, shoulder to shoulder, over a very long period of time. And now here they are, and there's this painful parting of the ways. But God overruled it for good. And to one of the ways in which he did so, we're going to turn for a moment at the end. For now, our task is to accompany Paul without Barnabas as he retraces his steps and visits again those cities where he and Barnabas have proclaimed the word of the Lord. At the end of chapter 15, we find them going through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And then chapter 16, verses 1 and following, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. We're going to go look for a little at Timothy. What kind of man did someone of the spiritual stature of an apostle Paul deem suitable as a companion and fellow gospel Worker. Well, the answer is in four parts. And in each part, we will have an answer to the question that we're addressing this evening. What kind of things are we to be looking for in men whom we might train, call, and send out into gospel ministry? Well, I draw your attention, first of all, to Timothy's faith. He is described in verse 1 as a disciple. 
He was probably one of Paul's converts from the first mission. Back in chapter 14, we read about Paul and Barnabas making their first visit to Derby and how they preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples. It's great commission language. Disciples are to make disciples of others. And that is what Paul and Barnabas did in Derby. It's what they did in all of these Galatian cities. And the way in which Paul speaks elsewhere of Timothy would suggest that among those disciples was Timothy. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17, for example, he calls him my son whom I love. In Philippians 2 verse 12, he writes how Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he addresses him as my true son in the faith, and in 2 Timothy, as my beloved child. Timothy wasn't his natural son. Timothy's natural father was a Greek. But the way in which Paul habitually speaks of him would suggest that Timothy was his spiritual son, that Paul was his father in the gospel, that Timothy had come to Christ as Paul had preached the gospel. And then there's the word itself. Disciple. Isn't it strange that it is a word that we rarely use to describe a fellow Christian. When I was coming across the Atlantic to, to Chicago on, on Friday, I discovered that I was sitting beside a, a delightful disciple. Well, we would use the language of fellow Christian or believer or brother but disciple? It's a pity that we don't use it, for it's a great word, isn't it? A disciple, a learner. It is what Christ himself was in relation to his Father in heaven, and it is what Christians are in relation to Christ. Learners. He is our teacher. He is our master like Mary. We sit submissively at his feet and learn from him. And what we learn from him, we seek to live by and to teach to others. So Timothy was a disciple. We can speak about his faith in Jesus Christ. And you understand where we are when we do that. When we speak about someone's faith. In Jesus Christ, we're right at the foundation of it all. If a gospel worker may be compared to a building, faith is the foundation. Or if we may compare a gospel worker to a tree, then faith is the root. It's what comes first. No one is ever qualified to be a servant of the word who has not, first of all, been mastered by that word. Who does not know its transforming power in his own life. We come back to this word disciple. The Great Commission is all about disciples making disciples. No one is qualified to do that who is not a disciple himself. We want to bring men and women, young people, boys and girls, into a relationship to Jesus in which he is teacher and Lord. And the one who would do that ought, first of all, to be in such a relationship himself. Now, it's not that God can't use unconverted men. He can. He used Judas Iscariot for a time. And he has used many another sins, men whom time has proved to be disciples, but in name. But what God may do in his inscrutable sovereignty in cases like that is no guide to church practice. The man whom Paul took with him was first of all a disciple. And we dare settle for nothing less. And so we examine them. We ask questions about their conversion. 
We look for the evidence of the new birth, for the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we don't give them opportunities. We don't encourage seminary training. We don't recommend them to the churches. We don't appoint them ourselves unless we are first satisfied as to this most vital foundational of matters. Brothers and sisters, you know very well that men have done themselves incalculable harm and they have done incalculable harm to the cause of Christ because they have not been true disciples. And whilst we are not infallible and we can be mistaken, it ought always to be an honest mistake a mistake that is made having done our best to satisfy us on this first and foundational point. So our attention is drawn, first of all, to Timothy's faith. Secondly, and this is more of an implication, our attention is drawn to Timothy's maturity. Timothy was a disciple, he was a Christian, but he was not a brand new Christian. If we date his conversion from the first missionary journey, he has been a Christian for at least two or three years, which may not seem very much to us. So there's one or two things that it's helpful to remember. One is that from childhood he had known the Holy Scriptures. Paul tells us that himself in his second letter to Timothy. Was it from his Jewish mother Eunice or his grandmother Lois or from the local synagogue or all three? We don't know the details, only the fact. There is many a young person who's converted and they've got it all to learn because they've no Christian background whatsoever, not Timothy. He had already been grounded in the truth of Holy Scripture. And then add to that the climate. Now, by the climate, I'm not thinking about the kind of weather that they had in Galatia, whether it was hot or cold. I'm thinking about how things were for the Christians in Galatia. They were hard. One of the things that Paul and Barnabas did in the course of their first journey was to encourage these brothers and sisters to continue in the faith saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. You read through Acts chapters 13 and 14, and you see the trouble that unbelieving Jews, hostile Jews, caused these early Christians. It's like a dark thread that runs all the way through the chapters. It's the kind of spiritual atmosphere that is fitted to do two things, to expose false believers and to mature true. And in the case of Timothy, it was the latter. And he had evidently attained considerable maturity. It's there in the commendation of his fellow Christians, and that's a matter to which we will turn in a moment or two. It's there in the decision of the Apostle Paul to take him as a companion and fellow gospel laborer. And it's there in Timothy's agreement to go, and we'll come to that in a moment as well, maturity. Timothy was not a novice. He wasn't a newcomer to the Christian faith. He had had time to grow, and he had evidently used the time well. Now, what is especially encouraging to me, and I am sure to you as well, is that Timothy was a mature young man. Now, I don't have to press the point of maturity itself in an audience like this. A prospective elder, for example, must not be a recent convert. 1 Timothy 3, verse 6, you know that. You know that when someone is converted, they need to be given time to mature before they can be encouraged to prepare for gospel ministry or appointed to office in the church. But brothers and sisters, let us not forget that that requisite maturity can be found in young men, very 
young men. And there haven't been few in the course of the history of the church. There have been many. And their names occur to you as readily, I'm sure, as they occur to me. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, George Whitfield, John Calvin, Henry Martin, the Cambridge Seven, those six young men who, under the mentoring of Thomas Chalmers, came to be called the St. Andrew's Seven. Or continuing in Scotland, I think, a few years afterwards, of that remarkable circle of men, William Chalmers Burns, Robert Murray McChain, Andrew and Horatius Bonner, James Hamilton, Alexander Somerville, John Milne, Robert MacDonald of Blair Gowrie. And the revival that there was in Scotland. And all these men were in their 20s. McChain had finished his course and was in glory before he was out of his 20s. Marvellously used by God as young men. And some of the men in that list and others were less than in their 20s when God began to use them. Can I say to you, let it be part of our vision as we think about raising up leaders for the next generation. Let it be something for which we pray. And let it be something to which we are open. That young as this young man is, he has already attained the requisite maturity. He ought to be in training. Or he ought to be in preaching. Or we ought in humility to be calling him to the pastorate and submitting humbly to his leadership. We ought to be sending him to the mission field. And to those young men here, perhaps late teens, early twenties, let it fire you with the ambition to be something for Jesus Christ when you see how God has used young men so wonderfully. Lay yourself at Jesus' feet. Say, here am I, Lord. Take me, young as I am, and use me for your glory and honor. Thirdly, Timothy's reputation. We thought about his faith we thought about his maturity, and now in the third place, his reputation. Verse 2, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Here's a young man who was highly regarded among the churches. He was known as a young man with gifts and with godliness. Folks appreciated Timothy very much. They were thankful to God for him. They were enriched by his ministry. Encouraged with how God was using him. We don't know the details, but the broad picture is very clear, isn't it? Perhaps it is something that the Apostle Paul asked about. Are there any promising young men here? And back comes the answer. There's Timothy. And then they tell him a little about Timothy. And then they're introduced to one another and the conversation begins and it it all continues as Timothy goes off with the apostle. Well, however it was, this was a factor, clearly a factor in the apostle's decision. Timothy's reputation. Here was a young man whom the churches and their leaders could wholeheartedly commend the gospel ministry. I think about a seminary considering a young man's application or a church considering a man for the pastorate or an association or mission board considering someone as a possible missionary candidate. How important that they have what Timothy had, the commendation of those who know them best. Their elders, their fellow church members, 
those who have served alongside them in this work or in that, those who have mentored them perhaps during their training, the congregation that they have served as an intern, what do they think? Now it is of course possible that a man may be the object of unwarranted hostility or criticism. His own congregation and elders may be so out of sympathy with Reformed convictions, for example, that the last thing in the world they're going to do is commend this man to ministry. But ordinarily, what others have to say about us is huge and ought to be a major factor in this matter that we're considering this evening. And in this regard, can I encourage you men who are in leadership here to take the lead in this matter? What do I mean? Well, let me give you an illustration. I have a very dear friend back in England who has been a gospel minister now for many years. When he had finished his training his elders put a public notice about him in a popular evangelical newspaper, commending him to the churches for pastoral ministry. A congregation in the north of England, very close to where I lived, saw the notice, invited my friend to visit, and that is how it all began. How much better that is than men taking it upon themselves to send out resumes to the churches. Now, I have to be careful because I'm a Scotsman and there's a reservation about doing things like that. And I have to confess that when I was in Grace Carlisle on the few occasions, I did get unsolicited resumes sent to me. My reaction was negative. (laughs) Brothers, if you have a promising young man at some stage, let it be known. Find a way. You have made the discovery that we're thinking about this evening. You've been able to identify. Here's a young man. Here's a man, an older man, whom you can commend to the churches. Let it be known. So we thought about Timothy's faith, we thought about his maturity, we thought about his reputation. And one last thing, Timothy's willingness to go. Timothy's willingness to go. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. Verse 3, and Timothy was willing to go. Now that is no small thing. Paul, for example, attracted trouble wherever he went. You go back through the history of the first mission in more than one place, his life was in danger, and you recall how on one occasion he was stoned and left for dead. (laughs) This man was dangerous company. And Timothy was willing to go. But there was something that lay nearer to hand. We read in verse 3 that Paul wanted to take wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Timothy, though a Jewish man born to a Jewish mother, had not been circumcised. And Paul knew that if he was to be an effective evangelist to the Jews, he needed to be circumcised. And so he was. Acting on the principle of a lawful submission to an unnecessary ceremony for the sake of the gospel, Paul took Timothy and circumcised him. Now you think about that, and it's probably best not to think about it too much. (laughs) Timothy was an adult, and there were no anaesthetics. How? painful. But he was willing to go through with it. We would not have the New Testament letters to Timothy and the example of Timothy, and Paul would not have had the companion and fellow worker that he had in Timothy had Timothy not been willing to go. 
with all that that involved. Or to put it another way, one of the marks of a man whom God is genuinely calling to gospel work is that they are willing to go, no matter what. And to any men in this building tonight who may be wrestling with this question of the call of God upon their life, let me appeal to you to have no hesitation about doing, going, whatever the cost. By the willingness of Timothy, and more importantly by far, by the willingness of Timothy's Saviour. Be inspired, be emboldened to count the cost and to go if the Lord would call you. So we thought about Timothy's faith, we thought about his maturity, we thought about his reputation, we thought about his willingness to go. Four things, four things which we should be looking as we think about men whom we might train, send out, call. A couple of exhortations and then a little appendix. Here's the first exhortation. Let this shape our praying. Well, what kind of men should we be praying as we think about the needs of the churches, as we think about the needs of the nation, as we think about the need for overseas missionaries, men like Timothy, men who are true disciples, men who are spiritually mature, men with a good reputation, men who are willing to go or to come or to do whatever the Lord is calling them to. Lord, give us men, give us young men like that. And my second exhortation, and believe me, this is a word for my own heart, let there be a willingness to part with them. Timothy was the apostle's gain, but he was a loss to the churches of Lystra and Iconium. And so it always is. What is gain for the kingdom of God here is loss for the kingdom of God somewhere else. But it must be a a cost, a loss that we're willing to bear for the sake of of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And we can bear the cost, brothers and sisters, surely with the confidence that if it's the Lord who's behind it, he knows what he's doing and will make it up to us in some way or other and overrule the loss for good. A little appendix and then I'm done. And I love this. This section of Acts is actually the story of two young men, not just one. And it's easy to lose sight of the other. The first one to be mentioned, John Mark. At this point, from the Apostle Paul's perspective, he is in sharp contrast with the other. John Mark is not suitable. Timothy, he is persuaded, is, as indeed he proves to be over the long haul. Well, it's a story with a fascinating and encouraging sequel. For under the mentoring of Barnabas, things so change for John Mark that he too one day becomes a companion of the Apostle Paul. And in his letter to the Colossians, he speaks of John Mark as a fellow worker for the kingdom of God and a comfort to him. And then listen to this. This is from his second letter to Timothy. He says to Timothy, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. What a testimony to God's grace that is. He hadn't been strong to begin with. 
But you see what the Lord has made of him. There has been a maturing, there has been growth, and and doubtless Barnabas had much to do with it. And now get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. And nor is that the end of the story. For according to tradition, it was this young man who became the author of the second gospel. Our Mark's gospel from the pen of this young man. And it's such an encouraging message for today. That young man in your congregation who showed such early promise, he's not doing so well now, is he? He hasn't morally disqualified himself from pastoral ministry, but he's not the man that he was. He's made some mistakes. Perhaps there's been some backsliding. Or he's got cold feet. This perhaps happened with John Mark. And he's drawn back because of the cost. And perhaps there's been repentance. And you have every reason to believe that it's a genuine repentance, but you're reluctant because of what has happened to encourage him to go forward to gospel ministry again. Well, it may not be the Lord's will to make that young man a minister of his word. God may have something else for him to do. But on the other hand, it may be the Lord's will to make of him a gospel minister, as was certainly the case with John Mark. Can you be a Barnabas to him? Can you spend time with him? Can you help him to mature in godliness and in grace? There is no telling what the Lord may do with that young man. That young man. The God who so worked in the life of this young man, John Mark, who gave him such astonishing usefulness in the kingdom of God, may do the very same with that young man and make you the instrument by which it happens. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your words. We thank you for Timothy. Give us, we pray, men, young men, like Timothy. And we pray for the John Marks. And we pray, Lord, that you will help them to mature and that your hand will be upon them and that it may please you to take at least some of them and leaving their early failures behind them, move on into a maturity and usefulness of which perhaps we can scarcely imagine. Lord, hear the cries of your people, Lord of the harvest, to send out just such laborers into the harvest field. Amen. Amen.